Hi, this is Coach Chuck of the National Free Flight Society's Youth Development Program. We welcome you to today's video. Uh, the purpose of these videos is to help uh, newcomers to indoor flying, including students in classic competitions such as uh, Science Olympiad, uh, get started in their building and flying processes. Uh, if you get something out of this video, we'd appreciate it if you like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you'll be notified of new videos as they come along. Today I want to talk to you about matching your rubber motor to your prop pitch for indoor duration flying, uh, specifically for Science Olympiad or uh, TSA or some of the entry-level uh, duration events through AMA. Uh, this is one of the most critical uh, areas of optimization for your plane and where you're going to find uh, the, the most improvement in performance once you have a well-trimmed, well-flying airplane. So in order to do this, first we need an understanding of the forces on an airplane in flight. And first we have gravity. Uh, gravity or the weight of the plane is a given. If you have a way of controlling gravity, then you probably have better things to be doing than working on Science Olympia. Uh, but given that uh, gravity holds the plane down, uh, we need to counteract gravity. So the opposing force to gravity, of course, is lift. Now, lift is not uh, inherent in the airplane as it sits there, but it's generated by movement. As the plane moves forward, you generate lift, uh, so uh, speed will translate to lift. Velocity translates to lift. Uh, so how do we get movement of the airplane? We need thrust. Thrust, either from a propeller or from a jet engine, moves the plane forward. And so thrust is a force that causes movement. So indirectly, thrust will cause lift. And of course, uh, if you have a force moving the plane forward, you've got an opposing force, and that is drag. A uh, plane sitting on the ground has no drag, but drag is generated by movement. Again, uh, speed of the airplane will result in drag. So the higher the speed, the higher the lift, the higher the speed, the higher the drag. So those are the basic forces on the plane. Um, now look, let's look at energy and the energy work equivalents. We have several kinds of energy involved in our flight. The first is kinetic energy. Kinetic energy has to do with speed. Uh, it actually goes with the square of the velocity of the plane. And uh, the, there is an inherent energy in a body in motion. Uh, that's called kinetic energy. Second type of energy is potential energy. Potential energy is the energy that has the possibility of being released uh, in some sort of action. The potential energy we have here, uh, first of all, is altitude. So if you take a mass and you lift it up, you've done work on the mass with your hand and it now has a higher potential energy because it can drop to the floor. It, it can move. Uh, and so that's one form of potential energy is altitude, moving a mass to a higher altitude. Uh, the second kind of potential energy in this case is stored energy in the uh, rubber motor of the airplane. Uh, this is a, uh, you're, you're putting work into the motor as you wind the motor, and that work is stored in the form of energy. We can convert between these different forms of energy uh, with some efficiency. Uh, we can convert the stored energy in the motor into um, uh, kinetic energy. We move the plane forward. So we're taking energy out of the motor and converting it into uh, uh, kinetic energy, the plane is moving forward. We can also allow the plane to climb, so we're increasing potential energy at the expense of our uh, stored energy. 
uh, altitude potential energy as opposed to our, our rubber stored energy. So we can convert between the different kinds of energy involved here. Uh, another conversion would be, uh, uh, imagine a glider with a lot of speed. You can climb in that glider and the speed is converted to potential energy as the plane slows down, it gets to higher altitude. And at some point it will stop climbing uh, because we've run out of uh, potential uh, kinetic energy and converted it all into potential energy. We can convert it back to kinetic energy by diving down, picking up speed, but losing altitude. So we can convert back and forth, but there are some efficiency losses with each conversion. Now, the second area we need to understand is work and the equivalence between work and energy. Work can be defined as force times distance. Um, and so uh, you, you can do work by pushing something along and moving it. Um, you can also do work rotationally by winding up your rubber. You're doing work on the rubber and that results in energy stored in the rubber. The units for work and energy are the same. So there is an equivalence between work that you do and energy you've stored. Of course, there's efficiencies involved as well. Thrust without motion or a force pulling the plane forward, but you've got the brakes on, uh, does not do work. The plane doesn't move. It doesn't do work on the plane. You've actually moved a bunch of air with your propeller or your jet engine. So you have done work on air, but you haven't done work on the plane. So you can't change the kinetic or potential energy of the plane if the plane's not moving. So work is force times distance. Um, work is taken from when you're flying, uh, work is taken from the stored energy, in our case, in the rubber motor. Um, and that work or energy can be used to move the plane forward at a given speed. You've got a force moving the plane forward and you've got speed. And so you're doing work on the plane by moving it. You've also got drag. So the faster you move, the more work is wasted fighting drag. Um, but if you have excess work, if you're expending excess energy, more than is needed to overcome the drag, to fly at the speed needed, to maintain the lift needed, then the plane will climb. So the work can be used to convert to potential energy in the altitude of the plane by working a little harder, working a little faster. A shortage of work will reduce the speed because of drag, which will reduce the lift, reducing the altitude. Now let's look at power versus work. Power is the rate of work or the rate of expending energy. So remember work was force times distance. Now force times distance over time is power. So the rate at which you use energy or the rate at which you do work is power. You can rearrange those uh, terms to say uh, power is force times speed. Speed is just distance over time. So force times speed is power. So the more power you put in, the more speed you have. And remember, speed gives you lift. And so the more power, the more rapid you're climbing. So energy or work allows you to climb. But power, how fast you're putting that work in or out, uh, determines how quickly you climb. A lack of power will result in descending because you don't have enough speed uh, to, to keep the plane up. So power is the key to climbing. So keep that in mind as, as we move forward today, power is the key to climbing. Now we talked about power being force times speed, and that's in a linear sense. We also have power in a rotational sense. And the equivalent in a rotational system to force is torque. It's the force of the motor trying to turn the propeller. That's torque. The equivalent of speed in a rotational system is rotational velocity 
And we can consider that in, in English units to be revolutions per minute or RPM. So rotational power is torque times rotational velocity. Uh, linear power is force times speed. So let's keep that, those in mind as we move forward into considering our rubber motors. Now, if we take a look at a rubber motor, uh, the torque is supplied by the rubber to the propeller. As you twist the rubber, you're uh, elastically stretching the rubber, but you're also displacing each leg of the rubber about the center of, of the uh, uh, stretched piece of rubber. And so you actually end up with small, what we call moments. It's a force times a distance about the pivot. So you've moved the rubber outside the pivot or the center line of the rubber and you stretch it. So it has a force and it has a distance from the pivot. And so it generates a torque. Torque from the rubber motor is basically the same, there's small difference, but it's basically the same whether the motor is wound up and held still, you're still holding it in your hand, or when you release the propeller and the rubber starts unwinding, the torque is fixed by the thickness of the rubber or the cross section of the rubber and the number of turns you put on it. So we call that a torque boundary condition. The torque is fixed by the condition of the rubber. It's not fixed by the propeller. So what we're putting into the propeller system is a torque from the rubber. Looking at power, power is torque times the rotational velocity of the propeller. If torque is fixed by the rubber, then how is power impacted by the propeller? Well, basically, if the pitch is reduced on a propeller, there is less load on the rubber motor. Now, if you're trying to push your car and someone takes their foot off the brake and you're pushing just as hard, what happens? It goes faster. Well, the same thing here. You take your foot off the brake, you, you reduce the pitch. It's easier to turn the propeller against the air now. The torque is the same, the, the rotational force trying to turn the propeller is the same. So now the propeller turns faster. So if we reduce the pitch, the rotational velocity increases, the torque stays the same, that was set by the rubber. So our power goes up as we reduce the pitch. Conversely, if we increase the pitch of the propeller, we put more load on the rubber, the torque doesn't change, so the velocity, rotational velocity slows down with higher pitch. And so torque stays the same, times velocity is lower, our power comes down when we increase the pitch. Now, uh, for some, this may seem non-intuitive, um, but the bottom line is the power needed to climb is proportional to torque and speed, but it's inversely proportional to the prop pitch. Increasing the pitch reduces speed and therefore reduces power. Uh, it's not necessarily a linear relationship, but for the purposes of this discussion, we can say that torque is proportional to, I mean, power is proportional to torque over prop pitch. Now, this is where it may become a little non-intuitive and, and uh, I want to bring up an electric motor because a lot of us have played with, with various um, uh, radio control uh, airplanes or uh, uh, drones and, and so forth. And on an electric motor, your boundary condition is not torque. Instead, on an electric motor, the power source is voltage from a battery and your voltage is your potential of your battery. That's your boundary condition at the end of the system. Um, with a DC motor, uh, without a speed controller, the speed is set by the voltage. So if the voltage is, is a fixed constant, so is the speed. Uh, a motor is often rated in, in revs per volt. Um, 
and and it might be uh, K, K revs per volt, thousands of RPM per volt. Um, so the RPM is fixed and or the speed and not the torque. So if we go back and look at power now, power is torque times speed. Your speed is fixed. What happens when you increase the pitch of the propeller? Now you put more load on the motor, but the motor inherently wants to go the same uh, rotational speed. So it takes more torque to do that. So on an electric motor powered plane, increasing the pitch will increase the power of the system and the plane will climb more. And this is opposite of what we see on rubber. And so this may be causing some of the confusion of why increasing the pitch doesn't increase the power of the system on, on a rubber uh, system. So your boundary condition on an electric motor is speed, whereas the boundary condition on a rubber motor is torque. For the rest of this conversation, we're gonna focus on the rubber motors with a torque boundary condition. So let's look at the torque curve of a rubber motor. And this is with a rubber motor completely wound. So this is the unwind torque. Uh, the difference between winding torque and unwinding torque is a subject for another video. Um, we are at the highest torque at the far right of the curve. And we quickly drop in torque as we start to unwind the motor. And then we have a long, slow decline in torque. And then finally, when the last knots are gone from the rubber motor, the torque again drops uh, quite suddenly. For a given stiff propeller, single pitch propeller, and a given airplane with a given trim setup, there's going to be a certain torque needed, which generates rotational speed in the prop to provide just enough power for the plane to stay in level flight. Above this torque value, the torque is excessive and therefore the speed increases. And so both the torque and the speed are higher than necessary to maintain level flight. And so the plane climbs. Uh, below this torque, both the speed and torque are below what's necessary to generate the power to keep the plane level and the plane descends. Um, the so, so we, we draw a line across here at, at a hypo, hypothetical torque that represents the torque necessary with a given propeller to hold the plane level during its flight. Of course, you're, you're trimming your airplane, your drag on your airplane, uh, the conditions in the room and so forth can affect this line, but we'll, we'll just draw a straight line for now. The torque of the rubber motor changes uh, dramatically during the flight. So in the initial portion of the flight, we see excess torque, excess power, and a steep initial burn. So in this case, the plane can cl climb very quickly, or if it's not trimmed properly, can uh, uh, dive suddenly or uh, not, not circle nicely. So uh, it's a very high power portion of the flight and your plane needs to be uh, trimmed for that portion of the flight. Uh, now, after that initial steep burn, we have a slow ramp. And if your uh, prop is set up properly, part of that slow ramp, you'll continue to climb, although the, the height of that green area is not very much. And so the climb is much reduced. You'll see your plane rapidly get toward the ceiling, and then the next few laps, you're gonna see a very slight climb. You're in that long decline there. And at some point it crosses over and you no longer have enough energy or power to keep the plane level, and it starts circling its way down. At some point in there, we're calling that cruise because it more or less keeps the same altitude, but it does start coming down and eventually uh, the difference between the necessary power and the supply power by the rubber gets uh, large enough that it starts coming down more rapidly and we call that the letdown phase. Um, in, in actual flight with a fixed propeller, you're either climbing or you're descending. There's only one point in the whole flight where you're actually 
holding level because that rubber torque is is going down the whole flight. Uh, so we call the area around that point cruise, but it, it's really only an instant that it's at the correct power level to, to stay at one height. Now we can make adjustments for uh, different ceiling heights. Generally, when we're in a high school gym, uh, the ceiling is fairly low. We call it a cat one ceiling or category one ceiling. If the height uh, is, is below about uh, 26 feet, um, and we have to control the climb of the plane because if it's going to climb for half the flight, it's going to be in the rafters. And if you're beating against the, the rafters, um, you, you risk getting caught up there. You risk the plane steering off course and getting into a wall. Uh, and you're using energy at a rate faster than necessary to hold the altitude of the plane. So you're wasting energy. Um, so how can we make adjustments for that ceiling height? The first thing we can do, as we mentioned earlier, is we can increase the pitch of the prop and that uh, lowers the power available. So to get the power needed for level flight, uh, when we increase the pitch of the prop, we have to increase the torque. So that brings back some of the speed we lost uh, by uh, increasing the pitch and it increases the torque as well. Remember power is torque times the rotational speed. So a higher pitch prop is going to require more torque to maintain the power needed for level flight. Um, and you can see as we move this line up, uh, the green area, the climb uh, becomes uh, smaller. And so the total climb of the airplane is less. But we do that at, ex at the expense of the letdown. Look at the red area of the descent. That has become a lot larger now. So we can control our climb, but now we're landing with a lot of winds left on the motor because the plane can't come down forever. It reaches the floor. Similarly, if we decrease the pitch, we've increased the power. So we need less torque to make the power we need to hold the plane in level flight. That increases the green area on the plot and we get a lot more climb, uh, but then the uh, letdown is not there and, and uh, we can run out of rubber before we get to the ground. So in a balanced flight, you're going to have as much climb as you've got let down. Now, another way to control the height rather than just increasing the pitch of the prop is we can unwind some of our peak torque. And as we take just a few winds out, maybe a few hundred winds out, we can eliminate that entire high torque portion of the curve and greatly control our uh, climb, total climb of the airplane. Um, we still, now we're just going to make it to the ceiling. We still have a lot more letdown than necessary, and we're going to land with extra uh, turns on the rubber motor. We find that a balanced flight, your unwind at the beginning of the flight is about the same number of turns on the rubber motor as the remaining turns at the end of the flight. And we call that a balanced flight. So using the same propeller on the same plane in different gym heights, one way to control your altitude of your flight is with unwinds of the motor. In a low ceiling gym, it may take considerable uh, number of unwinds to reduce the uh, uh, altitude of the plane. If you have a particularly smooth ceiling and if you're in an AMA class that allows steering, uh, one option is to let it bang on the ceiling a lot. Rather than taking winds away, let it beat up the ceiling uh, as long as you can steer it back to the middle of the room um, and uh, not give up those winds. Um, instead of changing pitch for the ceiling height, you can also 
uh, work with changing your rubber. If you increase the rubber thickness without changing the propeller or the plane, you now have more torque at a given uh, situation and the plane climbs more. The total winds are less, but uh, you have more torque available. Now, when you do this, if you had a well-balanced plane to begin with and you went to thicker rubber, you're probably going to want to re-optimize the pitch for that rubber. So increase the torque by increasing the rubber thickness and then increase the pitch to make up for that. And now uh, with the prop at a higher pitch, even though it's a higher torque, it's going to spin slower and you're going to bring things back into balance where you're going to balance the the climb and the descent to the airplane. Similarly, with reduced rubber thickness, you can reduce the climb, but you have a much longer letdown. Again, you can de-pitch your prop, uh, reduce the pitch on the prop to better balance the use of that thinner piece of rubber. So thicker rubber, higher pitch, you find an optimum there. The actual optimum for any airplane set up, airplane and propeller setup uh, is going to depend on a lot of factors and require significant experimentation. Typically, we see a pitch to diameter ratio of about 1.6 to 2.0. And on most of the Science Olympiad planes that we've built, we've seen the optimum closer to the 2.0 pitch to diameter ratio. What do I mean by pitch there? It's how far the propeller moves forward if it was uh, perfectly engaging with the air. There's no slip. So I like to think of it as the propeller going through jello. How far does it go forward in one turn of the propeller? That's your pitch, and you compare that to the diameter of the prop. We measure pitch as an angle. And typically, the, the uh, 2.0 pitch to diameter ratio is about 45 degrees of pitch on the blade at about two thirds of the way out from the root to the tip of the, the blade or from the, the axle uh, to the tip of the blade. So if you're not at 45 degrees at two thirds of the way out, um, you, you may want to change your pitch and then change your rubber as appropriate to, to get a balance of climb and let down. So basically, if, if you're, you've set your prop where you want it and you're running out of winds in the air, you wanna to go to a thinner piece of rubber to reduce the climb and increase the letdown. If you're um, climbing up, maybe not all the way to the ceiling or, or maybe all the way, but you're landing with a lot of turns of rubber left, then you might wanna try a slightly thicker piece of rubber uh, to better match the prop or uh, slightly de-pitch your prop uh, to better match the rubber. Okay, so what other alternatives do we have? Uh, we, we can see that we can compromise the two ends, the, the initial part of the flight, as well as the end of the letdown by, by dewinding and then um, uh, having winds left on the ground. But that's, that's winds of rubber, that's energy you've left in the bank and not used for actually flying the, the plane. What if we were to say, have a much higher pitch and so our climb is limited at the beginning of the flight and now somehow we change our pitch mid-flight to have a lower pitch and therefore we've reduced the green area above our high pitch curve so the, the plane doesn't climb as much. We've reduced the red area below the second curve so the plane doesn't descend as quickly. And then somehow we join those two lines during the flight. And that's what we call a variable pitch prop. Now, a variable pitch prop mechanism is not permitted in Science Olympiad, but it is permitted in F1D and F1M and certain uh, AMA competitions. So let's take a look at a, a variable pitch prop. Once again, a variable pitch prop mechanism is not legal for Science Olympiad and some AMA classes, but it's instructive for what we're trying to learn here. So this is a variable pitch mechanism. 
and let's see if we can get it to focus. And basically, as you increase the torque on the motor, the prop blades change in pitch just by twisting the uh, prop shaft. Um, there's a mechanism in here with a spring and we can adjust the high pitch and the low pitch with little screws here and the uh, prop will change pitch depending on the pitch, I mean, the, the torque of the rubber motor during the flight. So this variable pitch prop mechanism does exactly what we showed in this last diagram. We have a high pitch to start the flight. We have a low pitch to end the flight. And we join those pitches with some sort of line. A uh, variable pitch prop mechanism can be set up to gradually make the change. And that will cause a slow and controlled climb of the airplane shown in the green. And then the pitch of the prop will very much match the torque of the motor through most of the flights. So you have a long extended cruise and then uh, you have a low pitch and you have a limited letdown, just whatever you need to get to the floor. Um, you can also have a very quick transition of the prop from high pitch to low pitch. And in this case, we can see uh, the initial green on the right side of the plot shows an initial climb uh on high pitch and then the pitch gets to where it's too high for the torque of the motor and we actually descend and then you suddenly change to the low pitch of the prop and now all of a sudden the prop is turning a lot faster at the lower pitch more power is available even though the torque is lower and the plane climbs a second time and then as the torque runs down the plane will come down uh, generally speaking, uh, the F1D guys uh, like to have the double climb for a low ceiling, and you'll see more of a single climb for the high ceiling. Uh, some of the F1M flyers uh, find it best to have the, the long, slow change of the prop uh, for, for all ceilings. So there's different ways you can set up a variable pitch prop to do that. But we're not allowed to do that in um, uh, Science Olympiad, and uh, so we have to have uh, other options. So in Science Olympiad and limited penny plane in the AMA class, we can have a propeller such as this. It's called a flaring propeller. And what we have is the spar is down here and all of the area of the blade or most of the area of the blade is ahead of the spar. And what that does as the prop turns, it catches the air and the aerodynamic forces lift the prop to a higher pitch. And so what we call, this is called the poor man's variable pitch. So as the torque is higher, the load on the propeller is higher and the propeller is forced to a higher pitch. What we don't have on this type of propeller setup is some sort of stop to control our low pitch and a high pitch. On the variable pitch prop, we can adjust that uh, a low pitch and high pitch with screws between each flight and make fine adjustments. With the flaring prop, the uh, um, uh, pitch of the prop throughout the flight is controlled by the softness of the flare. How flexible is this? And it's a little bit hard to make adjustments. You can put tape on it. You can put glue on it, various ways to stiffen it up. You can sand it a little to make it more flexible. You can also change your starting pitch by whatever mechanism you have available. In this case, we have a wooden spar, so we wet it and we twist it with a heat gun on there to change our, our at rest pit, pitch. Um, so poor man's variable pitch prop or flaring prop. Um, in reality, the um, pitch of the prop is uh, gonna be set by the um, torque, and the flexibility of the blade is highly dependent on the position. So things can wind up and it can get, actually get stiffer. So it's not a linear response, but for the purposes of today's discussion, we're gonna draw it as a linear 
response. We're drawn it as a straight line on these plots and uh, notice the straight line continues to the beginning and end of the plot. We don't have the, the fixed high pitch and the fixed low pitch that we had on the variable pitch prop. In reality, it's probably not a straight line. It depends on the torque and not on the number of winds. Um, but power isn't linear with respect to pitch either. So this is for illustration only. Don't get too caught up in the fact that it's a straight line. If we have no flare at all, we have a straight line straight across the plot as we had before. If we add a slight amount of flare, but we still have a fairly stiff prop, then we have a shallow slope to that line. And you can see this reduces the total green area. So it reduces the climb. It reduces the total red area. So it reduces the descent, but it also in the middle during our cruise phase, it reduces the difference between the prop pitch and, and the, the torque curve. So this flattens the cruise area, makes, makes the plane fly more or less level for a longer portion of the, the flight. Now, if we increase the, uh, uh, the flexibility of the prop, so we go from a stiff flare to a medium stiffness, we've now uh, tilted that line even more and we've extended the cruise. Uh, we've, we've almost eliminated climb except during the real steep uh, portion of the curve and we've limited our, our letdown. Um, now we can make small adjustments to the number of turns on the motor or the number of unwinds before we launch and this will uh, affect the altitude we can reach. Just a small number of turns can make a large percentage change on the area of green on this. And finally, we can go to what I call a soft flare. Uh, this is where the, the uh, uh, prop is very flexible. And you can see that makes the line on the plot a lot steeper. And we can actually run into a case as seen here where you get a double climb, very much like the uh, variable pitch prop. Uh, it can result in a very limited climb because you're not limiting that uh, high pitch. Uh, and then a very long cruise uh, or even a, a, a double climb situation. And likely it's going to end up in running out of rubber before landing. Um, we observed this on one of my team's uh, limited penny planes at Eager, Arizona. They had a very soft prop. And no matter how much they uh, put on for initial torque, there just wasn't the area under the curve. And they would climb the 30 or 40 feet instead of the 100 foot ceiling. And then they would cruise at that altitude, maybe even let down a little and then go back up a little and then run out of rubber. And, and the plane would fall from about 30 feet. Uh, so they're using up the rubber, but they weren't effectively using the letdown phase, which shortened their duration. And they tried uh, depitching the prop to get more climb, but because the uh, flex of the prop was so soft, after that initial burst of power, it would go into a cruise mode and just would not climb anymore. We were able to stiffen up his, his prop, to uh, get the altitude and get the, the plane reaching the 100 foot ceiling. And we did that just by adding a strip of scotch tape uh, to the face of the uh, blade. Uh, so you may need to adjust the stiffness of your flare uh, based on your ceiling height, based on your plane's performance. And you can get to the point where the flare is too soft and uh, it might be ideal for a very low ceiling, like a 20 foot ceiling, uh, but uh, you're not gonna climb higher than that. So you do have to be able to adjust uh, the stiffness of your flare or have multiple propellers for, for multiple gyms. And uh, you also have to adjust the starting pitch of the propeller. If 
if you've softened the flare, then at high torque, you've got a lot more pitch than what you're measuring on the pitch gauge. So generally speaking, as you soften the, the flare, you also have to reduce your static pitch so that your dynamic pitch when it is flying is in the right range to match your rubber. So more variables, right? So let's summarize here. The prop and the rubber need to be optimized against each other to ensure the longest possible flights. This is one of the key areas in improving your flying once you have a good, well-trimmed uh, airplane. Uh, this is an exercise in power management. We looked at how power relates to climb and how, how torque and prop speed relate to power. So you use the power to climb, you control the power to cruise, and you let off the power to let down. You want power on the plane all the way to the ground, otherwise the plane doesn't have enough mass and too much drag, and, and if the prop stops turning, it just drops suddenly and you lose a lot of altitude, a lot of potential energy that could go into flying. Many of the airplane parameters impact this balance of power, drag being a, a critical one, but same with trim. So the decollage, how your, your wing is set up, uh, the twist of your wing and so forth will all affect how the plane flies, how much power is needed to maintain level flight. The circle size, a tight circle uh, is a draggy circle. And so you want to enlarge your circle to an appropriate size for the gym you're in and the atmospheric conditions in that gym. Do you have drift? Uh, you might need a small circle and start at one end of the gym if you notice uh, drift. But a small circle takes more power and you might have to adjust your uh, rubber and or prop pitch. The gym altitude, and I don't mean the height of the gym, but the local altitude will impact the performance of the plane. There's not as much air, so not as much lift at 7,500 feet, like in Eager, Arizona, as there is down at sea level. So you're gonna have to change your rubber to propeller matching as you change altitude. Say you're, you're going from your local gym at a mile high in Denver to uh, Science Olympiad down in Phoenix at, at a few thousand feet. So, um, the optimal prop, pitch, and rubber has to be found for any given situation. You need to make these adjustments. Increasing the pitch or reducing the rubber thickness reduces power. Uh, reducing the rubber thickness does it by reducing the torque. Increasing the pitch does it by increasing the load on the motor, and so you slow the unwind down. Remember, power is torque times uh, rotational velocity. This is the one area that may not be intuitive, and it's one of the keys to take away today. On a rubber motor, increasing the pitch will decrease the power and decrease the climb. Conversely, decreasing the pitch or increasing the rubber thickness increases power. The optimal flight usually has equal unwinds at the beginning of the flight, and turns remaining at the end of the flight. So we've introduced a number of, of new variables to look at while you're flying. And so that points out the criticality of your logbook and notes. It's critical that you take notes on your rubber winding, your torque, your, your uh, rubber thickness values, uh, and your propeller pitch, as well as stiffness in order to improve your flying and to change one variable at a time and understand what's changed and what the impact of those changes are. In addition, it's critical to wind using a torque meter. Without a torque meter, you don't know where you are on the torque curve, particularly in unwinding prior to your flight. We've found that a variable pitch prop or a poor man's variable pitch prop, the flaring prop, can be a huge advantage in a low ceiling. High ceilings generally uh, utilize the climb and descent during the whole flight with a minimal cruise. But a low ceiling, uh, the best way to uh, optimally use your rubber is to have a, a flaring or variable pitch prop. I hope this uh, discussion and video 
helps you to understand the adjustments that you can make while you search for the optimal prop and rubber motor combination for your plane and your gym as you get ready to compete. We thank you for watching today. If you enjoyed this, please like us. Please subscribe to our site so you can get notified as we put out additional videos. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.